The assembly is now in session. Mr. Holden notices the absence of a quorum. The sergeants at arms will prepare the chamber and bring in the absent members. The clerk will call the roll. Asha Jian, Alejo, Allen, Baker, Bigelow, Bloom, Bonilla, Bonta, Bro, Brown, Burke, Calderon, Campos, Chow, Chavez, David Chu, Canson Chu, Cooley, Cooper, Debobne, Daly, Daly, Dodd, Aikman, Frazier, Gaines, Gallagher, Christina Garcia, Eduardo Garcia, Gatto, Gibson, Gomez, Gonzalez, Gordon, Gray, Grove, Hadley, Harper, Hernandez, Holden, Irwin, Jones, Joan Sawyer, Kim, Lackey, Levine, Linder, Lopez, Lowe, Mainshine, Mathis, Mays, McCarty, Medina, Melendez, Mullen, Nazarian, Obernolte, O'Donnell, Olson, Patterson, Perea, Quirk, Rendon, Ridley Thomas, Rodriguez, Salas, Santiago, Steinorth, Stone, Thurmond, Ting, Wagner, Waldron, Weber, Welk, Williams, Wood, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Clerk. A quorum is present. I'd like to ask our guests and visitors in the rear of the chamber and in the gallery to please stand up for today's prayer. Today's prayer will be offered by Assemblymember Williams. Assemblymember Williams. Father, we live in a world of great confusion, despair, and problems. We need, therefore, the strength to recognize our weaknesses and the vision to identify what needs to be done. Give us, Lord, the wisdom to do what is right, the will and the determination to stand for the truth, even though it would be at times unpopular. But above all, Father, Help us serve with dignity and honor the good people of this great state. Amen. We ask our guests and visitors to remain standing and join us for the flag salute. Please join Assemblymember Jones as he leads us in the pledge. Members, as we honor one of America's greatest presidents today that united our country, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the, the flag for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Reading of the previous day's journal. Assembly Chamber, Sacramento, Monday, February 9, 2015. The Assembly met at 12 noon. Honorable Kevin Mullen, Speaker Pro Tem of the Assembly, presiding. Chief Clerk Ms. E. Garcia Dawson. moves and Ms. Waldron seconds that the reading of the previous day's journal be dispensed with. Presentation of petitions, there are none today. Introductions and references of bills will be deferred. Reports of committees, there are none. Messages from the governor, there are none. Messages from the Senate, there are none. Members were now at motions and resolutions. The absences for the day for legislative business, members Hadley, Irwin, and Lowe. For personal business, member Gonzalez. For illness, members Bigelow, Bro, Daly, and Dodd. Moving now to procedural motions. Mr. Holden, you're recognized for your motions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request unanimous consent to suspend Assembly Rule 118 to allow Assembly Members Gomez and Lackey to have guests and photographers on the floor today. Mr. Lackey will have guests in the area of the member's desk. Without objection, that request is granted. Mr. Speaker, I request unanimous consent to suspend Assembly Rule 45.5 to allow Assembly Members Baker, DeBobne, Gallagher, Holden, Mathis, Nazarian, Patterson, Ridley, Thomas, and Wood to speak on an adjourned in memory today. Without objection, that request is granted. A further 
Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Assembly Rule 96, I request unanimous consent to re-refer Assembly Bill 59, Waldron, from Health Committee and Local Government Committee to the Health Committee and Judiciary Committee. Without objection, the clerk will note. Thank you. Thank you. We have a number of guests who will be introduced today. Mr. Gomez, are you prepared? You're recognized for your guest introduction. Mr. Speaker, members, I ask you that you join me in welcoming two families who are visiting the state capitol as part of their California history studies for school. Please welcome the Kuvasi ears and the Kirkpatrick families from Orange County. In addition to touring the state capitol, they will be visiting the State Train Museum, Sutter's Fort, the historic Coloma uh, Goldfields, and the Donner State Party, the Donner Party State Park. And uh, most importantly, although they're from Orange County, at least the little the littlest one is a Dodgers fan, so I'm very glad that they're here. Let's give them a big round of applause. Let's proceed to our next guest introduction. Mr. Mathis, you're recognized for your guest introduction. Please welcome me. Please welcome the California Association of County Veteran Service Officers, or CVSOs, seated in the gallery. They, They are in Sacramento for the annual training conference. 2015 marks the CVSO's 70th year in service to the veterans of California. CVSOs are county employees located throughout the state. They are highly trained professional veteran advocates. CVSOs assist veterans and their families in applying for their federal veterans benefits. Last year, according to the required annual report to the legislature, the CVSOs brought in approximately 546 million of new federal monies paid directly to California veterans. <laughs> CVSOs provide their service to all veterans of the US military at no cost to the veteran. The Association of CVSOs promotes the welfare and rights of veterans statewide through legislative advocacy and provides training and education to CVSOs and their staffs. Again, welcome the CVSOs. Thank you, Mr. Mathis, and welcome to our veteran leaders. Colleagues, let's move to our business on the daily file. File item one, ACR 11, for purposes of third reading. The clerk will read. Assembly concurrent resolution 11 by Assembly Member Lackey relative to Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Assembly Member Lackey, you may open on the measure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. It is my honor to present to you ACR 11, which declares February 12th. 2015 as the birthday anniversary of President Abraham Lincoln. This year marks the 150th anniversary of one of the President's most defining achievements, the 13th Amendment, which abolished the abhorrent practice of slavery. Abraham Lincoln is one of our nation's most celebrated presidents and greatest leaders. He led our country out of the Civil War by not only preserving the Union, but ending slavery. His vision and leadership allowed our nation to endure one of its darkest chapters in its history. 
We would all do well to remember the example of his leadership during this time of adversity. ACR 11 reaffirms to us that President Lincoln rose from humble beginnings to achieve the highest elected office in the nation as President of the United States. This is truly the definition of the American dream and part of the legacy that Abraham Lincoln has left behind for each one of us. I am personally reminded of President Lincoln's values every time I come into the assembly chambers with his portrait hanging in the front of the room. President Lincoln will forever be known as one of our greatest presidents for his unwavering commitment to the preservation of truth, his strong integrity, and exceptional leadership skills. I ask for your I vote in support of ACR 11. Seeing and hearing no further debate, Mr. Lackey, do you wish to close? Yeah, I respectfully ask that the first roll be open for co-authors. Okay, the clerk will open the roll. This members is for co-authors. All those who vote, who desire to vote. All those who vote, who desire to vote. All those who vote, who desire to vote. The clerk will call the roll. Clerk will close the roll. 65 co authors are added. Without objection, can we take a voice vote on this measure? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. File item 2, AGR 4, pass and retain. I understand, Mr. Lackey, you have an announcement related to your item. I was just misinformed by one of my colleagues, but I'll take care of it right now. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker and members, in honor of Lincoln Day and the 150th anniversary of the passage of the 13th Amendment, which officially ended slavery, the State Archives has brought into the chambers the original resolution by the California legislature to ratify the 13th Amendment. Passed by the U.S. Congress on January 31, 1865, the 13th Amendment is one of President Lincoln's most important legacies. Members who are interested in viewing the resolution can do so after session adjourns in the front of the chambers. It's right there in that box right in the front. This is truly a historical document from our predecessors of this legislature. Staff is welcome to view the resolution in the rules room after 10 a.m. I would like to thank the Chief State Archivist, Nancy Linoyle, for allowing us this opportunity. Three of her staff are here with us in the chamber this morning. Rebecca Wint, Andrew Hyslop, and Lisa Prince. If we could please give them a round of applause, I'd appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lackey. Colleagues, let's move to our consent calendar. Does any member wish to remove today's item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, the clerk will read the second day consent calendar. Senate Concurrent Resolution 4 by Senator Pan, relative to physician anesthesiologist week. The clerk will open the roll on the consent calendar. All vote who desire to vote. 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 The clerk will call the roll and tally the vote. I 68, nay 0. The consent calendar is adopted. Colleagues, this concludes the business on file. We'll now adjourn to announcements and adjournments in memory. Request to adjourn in memory. There were a number of members that were granted prior permission to speak on and adjourn in memory. This time, Assemblymember Baker, you are recognized at your desk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of adjourning in memory today of a constituent of mine, Kazi Kosand Afsari, who uh, passed away January 11th of this year. Um, I rise today support adjourning in memory of, of Kazi because he was the kind of man that left a lasting impression on his community and truly lived the American dream. He left Tehran, Iran, 20 years ago, fleeing the revolution 
and came to this country and began from scratch learning English. Thank you to my colleagues. Learning English and building himself up from his bootstraps. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts degree in photography and then made the great decision to move to Lafayette in my district, where he built a terrific career as a realtor who was trusted by the entire community. He also dabbled and continued to have photography on the side. Kazi was a wonderful family man who taught his daughters, nephews, and nieces to put their mind to something and make sure they could accomplish anything if they just worked hard. He was known for this throughout our community. He was a beloved philosopher, and he enjoyed history and politics locally. He was a father, a brother, an uncle to anyone who met him and made sure that they knew they could make their lives count. It was with sadness that Kazi passed away suddenly on January 11th. He was with his beloved daughters, Layla and Sarah Afsari, by his side. I ask that we adjourn in his memory in honor of him today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Our next adjourn in memory will be presented by Mr. Dubovnik. Colleagues, today I rise to adjourn in memory of Rick Orloff, a veteran Los Angeles Daily News reporter who covered local politics in Los Angeles for nearly 30 years. If you follow politics in Southern California, then you know you read Rick Orloff's articles. Born on April the 12th, 1948 in Chicago, Rick lived in Indianapolis until he moved to Encino in my district in the 45th Assembly. A graduate of Birmingham High School and Cal State Northridge, Orloff earned a degree in journalism and began working at the Los Angeles Daily News in 1978. After a few years as an assistant city editor, Rick asked to be moved back to reporting and he returned to cover local politics in 1988. Rick was a dedicated professional. He was tough but fair. And when tracking down a story, he was relentless. On and off the record, he was known to be frank and didn't mince words. I can tell you that from personal experience. Rick was the dean of the City Hall Press Corps. And last week, they had a memorial at City Hall in the chambers with several hundred people to pay tribute to him. He was a mentor to younger reporters, uh, to elected officials, and was always known for good conversation and an occasional Friday drink after hours. Rick was 66 years old. He was survived by his brother Joe Orloff and his sister Joanne. Their families are a bedrock of our community. Rick's reporting made our community not only a stronger and better place, but made us as elected officials stronger, better people. His memory will be remembered uh, in the daily news throughout the new journalists who report on our community. I ask for everyone to pay tribute to Rick Orloff by obtaining his memory today as we think about how important it is in our positions to be honest and have integrity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Nazari, and you're recognized at your desk. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, for those of you uh, who knew Rick Orloff, there's only two words that could best describe him as a journalist, as a professional, as a decent human being. And that's being a straight shooter. He was a wonderful human being who didn't just have a disarming way and an approach in the work he conducted, but through that means he was able to bring out many important issues and stories that enlightened the wonderful world of uh, uh, Los Angeles City politics. Uh, I myself had an opportunity to get to know him at a younger age uh, when I was a Coral Fellow uh, about some 20 years ago and uh, uh, stayed and remained in touch with him and uh, was one of those gentle souls that would always take you in and offer you advice without pontificating. And uh, it was extremely sad to see him go, especially so early, given that how much more he could have accomplished with his work. Um, and so I ask all of us to join in rising in his memory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ridley Thomas. You are also recognized on this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to petition this body uh, to adjourn in the memory and witness of Los Angeles' journalistic eagle, Rick Orloff. I appreciate uh, uh, how many in this body remind me of my relative youth. I wish I was young enough to keep my hair from going white and my beard or head because Rick's wonderfully manicured head of hair seemed to stay jet black for the 21 years that I knew him. We met regularly in my public engagement, which began at the tender age of four as a volunteer for the Los Angeles City Council, sometimes chorused I was. I and uh, my then seatmate, Raul Bocanegra, who was a staff person to South Los Angeles Councilwoman Rita Walters, 
in interacted with Rick and came to learn about his wit and broad engagement in a myriad of public concerns. Later on, I seem to recall uh, Mike Gatto and Adrian Nazarian would join the ranks of council staff and become a part of Rick's world. Rick had an impact early on on many of us who are here today. While Raul and I sat together, we would chat about the respective current events of our district. He'd always let me know about how Rick was doing and how he was working closer with a newer reporter. Some of you know uh, Dakota Smith, who was producing a political blog called The Sausage Factory. I was pleased that Rick continued to invest in the next generation in journalism and public service. Rick covered all municipal affairs for the Los Angeles Daily News, now managed by the Los Angeles News Group and owned by its parent company, Media News Group. Daily News is a vital organ of communication for the San Fernando Valley and greater Los Angeles. Rick Orloff made sure that this organ functioned well. The San Fernando Valley is a unique region in the city of Los Angeles, like Many large regions in, uh, or many regions in large metropolitan areas, the valley can sometimes feel isolated and lost in broad civic discourse. This is not unique, as areas in my own South and West Los Angeles-based district have shared a feeling of being subordinate in important public conversations from time to time. Rick was unique in being able to bridge the communication and knowledge gaps uh, between regions of Los Angeles. He also was able to enrich the civic tapestry with informed reporting rooted in deep, long-standing relationships, careful study of the Byzantine bureaucracies of Los Angeles local government agencies, and close attention to the actors passing on the civic stage. As Rick's career went on, there was much more rapid passage of those actors via the enactment of term limits at various levels. This reality made good people like Rick Orloff even more important than they already were in their roles as the vanguard of the fourth estate. For you see, the absence of institutional memory among office holders or a community's connection to elected officials who develop deep personal relationships with their own constituents, residents, and voters over long periods of time meant that Rick stood in the breach to educate Angelinos on current affairs and new elected officials on the concerns of his readers. Rick developed a constituency, a following that was broad, diverse, and always felt included because he was not afraid to address concerns that had universal appeal and didn't put others down. He had a panoramic journalistic style. I saw Rick everywhere. I grew up with him, first at the Los Angeles City Council from my uh, very young years as a toddler until roughly uh, middle school, entering high school, then as a summer intern at the County of Los Angeles, uh, and then Supervisor Xavier Oslowski's office, then as a recent college graduate working on child advocacy and summer literacy programs at the Los Angeles County Office of Education in the Los Angeles Unified School District, and then as a staff person in the, uh, to the legislature in the Los Angeles City Council. Shortly after my declaration to compete for the trust and responsibility of representing the people of the 54th Assembly District, I looked up and the Los Angeles' Dean of Public Policy Journalism opined in his uh, tip-off column in the Daily News that, quote, the sun also rises, end quote. Rick Orloff had it like that. He could shape the development of people and communities with his consistent and informed reporting while taking well-earned license to promote a young leader whom he had molded in his own quiet way for many years through various means to serve greater Los Angeles and the greater good for this present age. The last time I saw Rick Orloff was a meeting of the Los Angeles Legislative Delegation convened by Mayor Eric Garcetti, uh, Assemblyman Gomez, and, and Nazarian. Uh, the meeting was closed to the press, save a brief photo op, and after it concluded, there was a scheduled announcement for the mayor's choice for the next chief engineer of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. As members of the delegation exited, uh, there was Rick standing by the door with a wink, a warm smile, and an encouraging word. I think Rick was able to slip in that meeting and hear the mayor's dialogue and legislative stratagem with the delegation. 
I suppose it's no wonder the San Fernando Valley supported the water bond and the rainy day fund. Rick Orloff's memory was celebrated this past Monday with the naming of a media conference room at 200 North Spring Street in the City of Angels, his true home, the Los Angeles City Hall. Rick's work lives in the hearts and minds of those who were impacted by his contributions to civil discourse, respect between communities, and the dogged pursuit of a better and more inclusive society. The eagle, Rick Orloff, has flown the nest. It's now left to us to carry on his legacy. I respectfully ask that the California State Assembly join Greater Los Angeles and beyond in mourning the passing of the beloved Rick Orloff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Ridley Thomas. Mr. Gowdy, you are also recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I always cringe when uh, people here refer to lobbyists as the third house. Uh, but one reference to power outside the building that I do not cringe at is when people refer to the media as the fourth estate. And Rick Orlov certainly exemplified uh, the power of the fourth estate and the power of the media to be a force for good. Uh, we all know some very, very good reporters. There are several still in the Capitol Press Corps. And when they cover an issue, when they articulate it, you know that they are speaking for the people. They, frankly, have the ability to keep us on our toes, to keep us honest, and they have the ability to speak for the people who have no voice. And every time Rick Orloff wrote one of his landmark columns, that's something that was, that was just apparent to anybody reading it. I always uh, liked talking with him. He had a way of uh, asking questions about the issues uh, that suddenly gave his opinion about the issues. And I didn't even mind when he summarized my quotes, because often they were a lot better than what came out of my mouth. Uh, but he really, really was somebody who uh, spoke for the San Fernando Valley. He spoke for the people of Los Angeles. And it's been a tough week uh, for journalism. Uh, journalism has lost three very, very important voices. Um, in the past couple of weeks, and uh, locally here in, in, in California and in the Los Angeles region, nobody will be more res missed than Rick Orloff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gatto. Our next adjourned memory will be provided by Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Speaker, members, we have lost another member of the greatest generation here in California. And that is why I rise today to adjourn in memory of retired Navy Lieutenant Commander Joseph Langdell from Yuba City, who passed away on February 4th, 2015 at the age of 100 years old. He was the oldest living crew member from the USS Arizona to have survived Pearl Harbor. As I was driving in this morning, members, I was trying to think about what is it that makes them the greatest generation. And it occurred to me that it is their selflessness that made them the greatest generation. So many of them, and I think you could say all of them, uh, forewent their own self-fulfillment, put off careers, put off college, and rose to the occasion to defend our country, to stand up, to rise to the call of duty and the cause of freedom and liberty. And in that selflessness, we saw that they conquered and, and put down the greatest threat to liberty that, we've, that the world has probably ever known in the Nazi regime in Germany. And ultimately, when they came back, they ultimately, through their leadership over the years, oversaw the fall of another authoritarian regime in the USSR and, and, and prevailed and won the Cold War. And Mr. Langdell was, was no different. Mr. Langdell graduated from Boston University and he had become a successful accountant. But he was so eager to serve that he signed up for a Navy program that allowed college graduates to attend officer candidate school and became ensigns within three months. He was known as one of the 90-day wonders who successfully completed the program. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Mr. Langdell spent days rescuing shipmates preparing for another potential assault, and helping remove the dead from the sunken ship. He served another four years in the Navy after that. Upon retiring from the Navy, Mr. Langdale became the owner of a furniture store in Yuba City and helped bring jobs to his community. He was always a very big advocate for economic development in the, in the region. He also served as president of the USS Arizona Reunion Association 
and was very active in organizing anniversary tributes for those who died in the attack. During Pearl Harbor, Mr. Langdell was not aboard the ship, but was resting in the bachelor's quarters. He had to watch from the shore as his comrades died. Because he was not in the USS Arizona, he was not eligible to leave his remains placed in the sunken ship after passing. However, he helped change the policy, and now the remains of all those who served on that ship during the attack can be placed there. What I remember most about Mr. Langdell is he was always a, a primary feature of our Veterans Day parade. And he would ride in a car and, um, as, as one of our oldest veterans uh, in the region. And he would always be available to tell stories about that time. But what I'm struck by that is that it was never about him. By, by making himself that center of attention, by telling those stories, he was keeping the memory of so many of his comrades who didn't make it back uh, when they served that call of duty. And I, I, I know that in his heart, that's what it was about for Mr. Langdell. And he touched everyone with those stories from World War II. We were, we were honored to have him as part of the parade each year. He will be missed de dearly as he was a constant reminder of the heroic actions performed by our military. Therefore, today I ask that the assembly adjourn in memory of Navy Lieutenant Commander Joseph Langdell. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Patterson, you recognize your desk for the next adjournment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, basketball legend and Hall of Fame coach Jerry Tarkanian passed away on Wednesday at the age of 84 in Las Vegas. He was surrounded by his family. His 31-year coaching career included three Division I schools, numerous conference titles, several trips to the Final Four, and a national title at UNLV. And Tark ended his coaching career in 2002 with his alma mater, the Fresno State Bulldogs. Throughout his career, he won 80% of his games, and he set a high standard for performance on the basketball court. But Tark was more than just a game changer. He was a life changer for the young men who played on his basketball teams. He often recruited team members from tough and challenged neighborhoods, talking to them one-on-one -on -one and getting to know them. While other coaches showed little interest in these players, Coach Tarkanian saw their potential. These players will tell you that they started out as young boys, but Tark turned them into young men and into successful adults. To them, he was a mentor, a friend, and a father figure. He is remembered for his big wins, his sideline towel biting, and his winning record. But above all, members, he is fondly remembered for his caring character that changed so many young lives. We were all fortunate to have a man of his caliber at Fresno State, and he will be greatly missed. Mr. Holden, you are recognized for this adjournment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, too, rise in recognition of the life of Jerry Tarkanian, also known as Tark the Shark. Tarkanian was born in Euclid, Ohio in 1930. He and his mother were refugees from the Armenian Genocide. At the age of 10, his family moved to Pasadena. Jerry played for Pasadena High School, my alma mater, and Pasadena City College, where he earned a scholarship to Fresno State. He returned to Pasadena City College as a basketball coach, winning the California Junior College Championship. He never had a losing season in 38 years of coaching. 39 of his players were drafted into the National Basketball Association nine in the first round. Coach Tarkanian was one of the winningest basketball coaches, but he was also a coach that taught the game. He was a teacher. And as you know, the metaphors around sports, when you teach about sports and winning, you're also teaching about life and winning. He was respected by his players, and he was respected by those players who played against his team, and I was one of those. He will be missed and we respect his longevity and career, and we give our heartfelt sympathies to the family. 
Thank you, Mr. Holden. Our next adjournment will be by Mr. Mathis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise today in adjournment in memory of Sanida Garcia, a former project director of Tulare County Office of Education, whom passed away on January 23rd at the age of 78. Ms. Garcia was a tireless pioneer of early childhood education programs in Tulare County and a pillar of the community. She was employed with the Tulare County Office of Education for 37 years where she was a champion for the county's child care programs. In 1998, the Sanida Garcia Child Development and Training Center opened in Visalia in her name. And by the time of her retirement in 2004, she oversaw the operation of 43 centers serving over 6,000 children and parents. Sanida was the first Hispanic and first woman to serve on the Visalia Unified School District Board of Trustees. She was inducted into the College of the Sequoias Hall of Fame in 1989, was the Visalia Chamber of Commerce Woman of the Year in 1996, the Tulare County Office of Education Manager of the Year in 2003 and named a legend on the Hispanic Honor Roll by the Tulare County Hispanic Roundtable and the Valley Education Foundation in 2004. For many decades, she touched the lives of thousands of children and families for the better throughout the Central Valley. And I thank the Assembly for adjourning today in her memory. Thank you, Mr. Mathis. Our final adjournment in memory today will be offered by Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise today to honor the passing of the Honorable Donald Holst Clausen, whose indomitable spirit, forthright, and honest demeanor earned him the respect and admiration of family, friends, colleagues, and all those he touched. First elected to the Del Norte Board of Supervisors in the late 50s, he then went on to represent the North Coast in Congress for 20 years as a Republican. Um, very different than the coast is these days. Um, but he learned very early on how to bring home the bacon to his district. He's recognized for many accomplishments related to infrastructure. Accomplishments that bear his name are the fish hatchery at Warm Springs Dam, the Highway 101 ba- bypass overpass in Roner Park, the Crescent City Air Terminal, terminal the 17-mile Highway 101 bypass around Redwood National Park, but his fondest accomplishment was in establishing the Lady Bird Johnson Grove in the towering Redwood National Park. Don was about all things, passionate about all things aviation. We too lost on February 7th, another of the greatest generation at the age of 91. He served as a Navy aircraft carrier pilot in World War II, and afterwards, when he returned home, he ran an air ambulance service in Del Norte County, where he settled in and married the love of his life, Jesse Oliva Piper. He finished his career uh, as an appointee of the Reagan administration in Washington, D.C. with the FAA, working on special projects. Don was also a humanitarian. After the Cold War, he saw the need for medical care in Romania. He gathered volunteer doctors and supplies to go to Romania to treat locals as the walls of communism crumbled. Don was a man who worked hard and did not care to take credit. He was a proud man and kept his accomplishments to himself. Indeed, his accomplishments, uh, credit for his accomplishments actually sought him out. My sincerest thoughts and prayers are with the loved ones of Mr. Clausen. I ask that we adjourn in his memory today. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Wood. That concludes our adjourn in memories today. Members, please bring all names to the desk to be printed in the journal. All requests to adjourn in memory will be deemed read and printed in the journal. Moving to announcements. First, on behalf of the Assembly, we'd like to offer our congratulations to our longtime sergeant, Jim Davitt, on the birth of his first granddaughter. Sahari Noel Ebanks was born this morning at 517 and weighs 7 pounds and 5 ounces. Congratulations, Jim. And moving to our session schedule, it's as follows. On Monday, February the 16th, that is President's Day. Tuesday, February the 17th, we have a floor session at noon. All other items remaining will be passed and retained. All motions shall be continued. 
Seeing and hearing no further business, I'm ready to entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Holden moves. Ms. Olson seconds that this House stands adjourned until Tuesday, February the 17th at noon. Quorum call is lifted.